Welcome to Goobertown Hobbies. My name is Brent. Today, we're going to paint a fantasy village for tabletop games. The look and feel of this village is inspired by the Warcraft franchise. Towns in Warcraft are colorful and they make me happy. Let's see if we can bring that to life. These medieval fantasy buildings were supplied by Tabletop World and they are gorgeous. Alright, let's talk about the vision for this project. Warcraft 2 may have been the first video game that really, truly captivated me. Sure, sure, I put a couple hours into Mist and Oregon Trail, but nothing compared to the time that I spent building cities and armies in Warcraft 2. I've always thought it was cool the way that these multiplayer strategy games reskin the buildings and units as different colors for different players and factions. Sometimes you load into a game and you're the blue player. The next time you might be red, or orange, or teal. This color coding helps with the gameplay, and somehow the units and buildings look great with any of these accent colors. I'm someone who spends a lot of time thinking about paint schemes, and it really tickles me how interchangeable those colors are. Warcraft 3 has more pixels, but the same fun architecture. I never played much Warcraft 3 though. I did play World of Warcraft. A lot. Again, the art direction is delightful. Something I love is how this game color codes the different towns. The shingles in Goldshire are all blue. In Lakeshore, they're all red. Homeowners associations in Azeroth don't mess around. Everybody's gotta use the same shingles. In Duskwood, they're brown and creepy. I roamed around for a while checking out some different towns. Hearth Glen is black-gray. Maybe not as striking as the other colors, but it's still a nice look. Of course, the best example is Stormwind. Stormwind is a city where each of the different districts has its own color. This idea of color-coded towns has ties back to the old strategy games, but here in the RPG, it's just good fun. I'm gonna do my best to paint this village like it belongs in Azeroth. Off camera, I painted these three in order to practice some techniques and get some ideas. And of course, I had to test out some whimsical colors for the shingles. Red. Blue. Green. All good choices, but we can't be too hasty. It's a big decision. The mayor of Goldshire took their sweet time and went on a vision quest before they figured out that they needed to paint everything blue. On the fourth house, I refined my technique a bit and I filmed it. This house got to be purple. In addition to shingles, these buildings have stone and plaster, timbers, windows, and metal bits. This is a lot of surface area to paint, and a really shocking amount of detail too. Each one of these houses could be a project for a month, so I want to make sure that I have an efficient system to paint them. None of the tabletop world houses has the exact same layout as any of the houses from World of Warcraft, but they all share a bunch of the same design elements. Timbers and support beams running between sections of brick and plaster. Brickwork showing through underneath plaster. Windows with diamond-shaped bars. Bay windows. Dormer windows. Wooden doors with giant metal hinges. If I do a decent job at painting, this could totally be a town in the next Warcraft game. After those first four houses, I made some final tweaks to my paint plan, and I'm ready to dive back in. So here's the meat of this project. I've got six more tabletop world buildings, and we're gonna do some batch painting. I think this is a good size batch to paint because it fills up my desk without going over. I've got my comfy chair down here in the basement, and we're gonna do some airbrushing. I've been practicing with my airbrush recently, and this tool is really gonna help to speed things up. The first step is to get everything primed. I'm using Steinal Res Primer, which comes in a variety of colors. For this project, I mixed up a bunch of my own blends. I've got some colors here that should be good for wood, plaster, and stone. First, I primed the roofs. I'll choose shingle colors at the very end and paint those on by hand. For shingle primer, I'm just using up a couple of the color mixes that I didn't like as much as the others. 
Waste not, want not. While I was loaded up with a light brown color, I also hit a few sections of wood, like the dock and balcony of the fisherman's house and the interior ceilings for most of the buildings. Next up was light gray on the outer stonework. Because I've made the decision to paint the roofs by hand, I don't need to worry about keeping those borders neat and clean. I can keep working fast and loose, and not worry if overspray ends up on the shingles. Those big plumes of mist show that I'm working fast and really throwing down the paint. That mist will calm down in a bit when I start doing the detail work. These model houses are super detailed inside and out. I'm going to concentrate on painting the outsides, but I'm not ignoring the insides. I found that it's easiest to spray the inside walls with tan plaster color first, and then to shoot the wooden floors with brown. A bit of brown overspray on the walls looks like weathering, but tan spray on the floor looks like a shoddy paint job. Sometimes order really matters, and I'm glad that I did a few practice houses before I dove into the big batch here. Around this point, I had the major blocks of color primed, and for a lot of those regions, that primer is also the base coat. I switched to my airbrush with the smaller nozzle size to get in and start doing some detail work. This next step is a big one. I'm making all of the timbers and support beams brown. For the next few hours, I'm painting timbers, but this is still way faster than doing it with a regular old paintbrush. My airbrush skills are just barely good enough to get this done without too much overspray. A little bit of overspray onto the stonework isn't the end of the world though. The next steps are to make the rocks a bit more realistic by adding random splotches of brown and black ink. This ink goes on smooth, and I can go as light or dark as I want to. We're just making sure that not everything is the same shade of flat grey. After a round of brown ink, I came back with black. This natural variation is gonna make these rocks look believable. They're already looking better than they were, but I've got a few more steps to make these bricks even better. Okay, let's get back to our source material for a moment. The stone on these Warcraft buildings is grey with a bit of brown, and I'm happy with this approximation. Now look at the places between the stones. The grout is a bit lighter in color than the surrounding brickwork. I've got a really fun way to make our grout look like grout. I'm going to use literal grout. Unsanded grout is an extremely fine powder that's meant to stick to things. One of the reasons that I love these tabletop world buildings is because the gaps between the bricks are nice and deep. The strategy here is to ladle some grout powder onto the brick walls and then use a brush to get most of it deep into those crevices. Once the powder was where I wanted it, I used a spray bottle filled with water to wet everything down. When that dries, the grout will be set in place. I really like this technique. Most of the strategies that us mini painters use for painting stonework normally results in the grout or mortar being a darker color than the surrounding stones, when in reality, having a tan grout is much more common. To get this particular color, I bought some white grout and some brown grout, and I added just a bit of brown to white to make this tub of tan. Back in 2019, I traveled to Canada to paint a realistic village with my buddy Neil on the Real Terrain Hobbies channel. At the time, Neil had come up with the idea of using weathering pigment as grout. That looks great, but it turns out that actual grout is way cheaper and maybe even works a bit better. Luke at Geek Gaming turned us both on to using this unsanded grout. Thanks Luke. Live and learn. So I let it dry overnight, and then I used a big paintbrush to play archaeologist and remove any loose powder that was still hanging around. The stonework isn't quite done yet, but we're well on our way. All that powder was messy, but I think it was worth it. Okay, there's one more step that I'm doing down in the basement. One last bit of work for the airbrush. I want to paint the windows. Back to the game footage. In Stormwind, most of the windows are lit up, but a few are dark. I decided just to light up all of the windows in my village. Goobertown is a bright and happy place. It's a warm, friendly light coming out of these windows, 
like all the rooms have cozy fireplaces. I used my airbrush to squirt each window with a bit of ochre yellow paint. After two or three thin coats to build up that warmth, I'm finally ready to take this village and my comfy chair back upstairs. So this is where we're at. I haven't really used a paintbrush yet. Let's go ahead and sort of use a paintbrush. I loaded a dry brush with some cheap craft paint. Dry brushing wastes a lot of paint, and I don't think quality really matters much. This is Vanilla Off-White from Craftsmart. I went through and dry brushed all of the brickwork. The rocks on these buildings have a lot of texture on them, and they take dry brushing really well. After this step, I'm definitely liking the brickwork. I could weather and stain them a bit with some wash, or I could leave them clean and happy. I'll decide later on. One place where I am using a wash is on the windows. I'm using a red-brown flesh wash on each of the windows. This adds some subtle color variation like you might expect to see in old-timey glass. It also makes everything that much warmer and friendlier. I could almost put this on a table as is and play some games. Almost. We're still missing some details. And of course, the most important bit, colorful roofs. A lot of the windows in Stormwind have these dark metal bars over them. Some of the tabletop world windows have bars too, so let's use a dark grungy metallic color. This is the first time that I'm using an actual paintbrush with actual paint on this project. This is where things slow down a bit, but that's alright. I think this detail work is really going to be worth it. Painting the window bars and such is covering up a lot of the yellow overspray, but not all of it. Some of that yellow overspray is going to stay around to act as an easy little glow effect. After the outside of the windows were looking good, I switched to the inside. I'm using a deep blue for these, like maybe it's dark outside. Now, the inside of these houses aren't going to be seen very often, but it'll make me happy to know that there's a basic paint job in there. I think I'll be alright without painting the window bars on the insides though. My patience has its limits. Okay, next up is some dark brown wash for the wood. This is for the interior floors and ceilings, as well as a few sections on the outside of the buildings. For this, I'm trying to use up my wash from Vallejo because I don't like it very much. I've thinned it with a bit of matte medium and water, and I'm chucking it down on all this wood to darken up the cracks and give a bit more contrast. Okay, now I'm loading up my brush with the same mix of Steinal Res Primer that I used to airbrush the exterior timbers. I'm using this on sections that I missed earlier, as well as some of the interior window frames. I think once those interior window frames are done, the insides of these buildings are good enough. On to some metal bits. I've got a dark steel color here that I'm using for chimney tops, door knockers, and hinges. You can see that some of the doors in Stormwind have very similar big steel hinges, so it's nice that we're able to carry that through to the Tabletop World Village. And then we start getting into more and more specific details. The fisherman's house has a lot of ropes, so I'm painting those with a leather brown. Some of the other houses have a rope on a peg here or there, and they're getting the same treatment. Two of the houses have an orange pumpkin sitting outside. And look, some corn. I can get lost painting these models for hours and hours at a time. There's just so much detail that pulls you in. On this corn, the individual kernels are sculpted. If I wanted to go nuts, I could make this look like dried maize with a variety of different kernel colors. Perhaps it's better to keep moving along though. And here's a bucket. That'll be a different shade of wood brown. Alright, I slapped on a bunch of the flavor details, and now it's time for the best part. It's time to choose a color or colors for these rubes. So at this point, I have the first four houses that I painted with their fun colors, and I have six buildings that are still waiting for that spark of life. It's so hard to pick. This stuff looks good in almost any color. If I were to make my whole village a single color, what should it be? Maybe I can take the coward's way out and just make them all different colors and never really commit. I decided to keep trying some options to see if I could find a winner. 
The blacksmith already had a nice coat of grey primer on the roof, so I'm going to see what happens if I put some black contrast paint on there. I don't think that I want to paint all of the buildings black, but this is one of the colors in the Warcraft games, and I want to at least see how it looks. These buildings are sculpted to have some wear and tear on them. A lot of the shingles are missing. This place probably leaks when it rains. The roofs and Stormwind are in better shape, but in places like Alterac, there's a lot of similarities. I've seen some people paint these tabletop world models up as creepy ruins or ghost towns, but I'm gonna go for a happier look. I think it's more likely that a color like red or blue will be the best choice for Goobertown. I've got some red-brown brush-on primer and some ocean blue primer, and I laid those down as solid base colors. After that base color, we have options for different washes and different dry brush colors to pull them in whichever direction seems fun. The washes deepen the color and add contrast, and a bit of dry brushing really brings out the highlights. Here's a couple varieties of red. Red would look good across a whole town, and it's the color that I associate with meeting Denath Trollbane and Alaria for the first time. But I don't know. Let's try blue. From this ocean blue primer, I can either try going more towards teal, or more towards true stormwind blue. On the fisherman's house, I used some thinned down pterodon turquoise contrast paint to bring it to life. And then I flipped the house over, and on the other face I used some bright talisar blue contrast paint. When those were dry, I got my crafts paint out for some dry brushing. A nice greenish ocean blue on the teal side, and a bluer island blue on the other side. That blue is such classic Warcraft. On the big townhouse model, I tried using blue ink on the shingles. Inks are thinner than contrast paint, so they really get down into those grooves. After that, I dry brushed over with pale blue. The detail on these models has a sharpness to it that does a lot of work for us, both in the way they take washes and in the way they take dry brushing. These are really simple steps, but the results are quite nice. I really do like this blue townhouse. This could fit right into Stormwind. I think we've got some really great options here. It's time to make some choices. On the one hand, some of these paint jobs have grown on me, and I'm hesitant to change them at this point. On the other, I still love the audacity of the mayor of Goldshire who makes everybody use blue shingles. I'm the mayor of Goobertown. I feel like I should be decisive. I decided to pick three of my least favorite paint jobs and reprime their shingles with ocean blue. I'll make these all the same color and see how I feel. The choice has come down to teal or true blue. This is a hard choice. Blue is classic Warcraft, but maybe that's too vanilla. Maybe I should be doing more than just copying the mayor of Goldshire. Goobertown should have its own vibe, right? We're going with teal. I got to work laying down the turquoise contrast paint, and when it was dry, I got out my dry brush and put down the ocean breeze. The final color recipe was ocean blue primer, pterodon turquoise, and ocean breeze. After I fixed up the other side of the fisherman's house, I had a total of four buildings with Goobertown turquoise. This is Goobertown. It's bright and fun and unmistakable. So am I ready to change the color on the other six houses? Actually, no I'm not. I've become attached, and there's something really fun about having all these colors on the table at once. Typical Goobertown. In particular, I don't think I can change the color on this blue one. This really looks like it belongs in the Trade District of Stormwind. I'm gonna leave it this way forever. I'm still cranking away on some of the details on these houses, but they are totally ready to be terrain for tabletop games like D&D or Warhammer or Frostgrave or anything else. I don't know if I'll ever do anything with the interiors, but for now, it's just fun to know that they're painted. You may have noticed that the fisherman's house is a bit wobbly. That's because it's meant to be on a river or a lake. One of these days, I may do a resin pour for a realistic water effect. Alternatively, I could just even out those posts and turn the dock into a deck. 
Maybe this isn't a fisherman's house at all. Maybe the owner just has an awesome patio and balcony because she likes to have people over for barbecues. I'm gonna keep building Goobertown, and I'm gonna keep pondering about these colors. Maybe someday Goobertown will have districts the way that Stormwind does. Whatever I do, Goobertown is gonna be colorful and fantastical. I'd also like to print out some World of Warcraft minis one of these days. Obviously, this video was all about the buildings, but I quite enjoy the character design too. In the meantime, I've got plenty of off-brand citizens to wander around in Goobertown. So many goobers. Artisan Guild in particular has a style that reminds me of Warcraft in the good way. Oh yeah, this goober fits right in. Huge thanks to Tabletop World for supplying the models for this project. These buildings have showed up on my channel several times now, and I'm still not tired of painting them. It's always fun to get a box from Croatia packed with houses and newspapers. I wonder if I can read this. Ah, the Wu-Tang Clan. The same in any language. But yeah, check out Tabletop World. They have a ton of great terrain for sale, and they keep adding to their collection. Alrighty. The Warcraft-style Goobertown is well on its way, and I'm ready to start playing some tabletop games. And that's it for this time. Thanks so much for watching.